Good afternoon or good morning, as case may be. You're all very, very welcome uh, to this latest uh, edition of the Development Matters series, uh, which is um, hosted by Irish Aid, the Irish Government's Development Cooperation Programme, um, with, uh, with the Institute of International and European Affairs. We're really delighted to be joined today by Rebecca Greenspan, who is the Secretary General of the UN Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD. Um, uh, Rebecca has been generous enough to take time out of her extremely crowded schedule to speak to this IIEA audience today, and we're, we're really delighted and privileged. Uh, before I go further, I will hand over to Michael Gaffey, Director General of Irish Aid, to say a few words. Thank you uh, very much, David. Just checking, can I be heard? Yes? Yes. Great. Thank you very much, David. And uh, it really is a big honour and a real pleasure for me as Director General of Irish Aid to, to welcome Rebecca Greenspan, Secretary General of UNCTAD, uh, to this IIEA Development Matters uh, series. Uh, David will, I know, introduce uh, Rebecca's uh, very, very um, impressive CV, but I, I just want to say that she is a renowned economist and advocate of human development and has had a very distinguished career so far at the United Nations. And before that, she held a number of ministerial positions in her beautiful home country of Costa Rica. UNCTAD, um, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, supports developing countries to access the benefits of a globalized economy more fairly and effectively. And it was established by the UN General Assembly in 1964. So next year, uh, 2024, is the 60th anniversary of UNCTAD. And not by, by coincidence, next year is the 50th anniversary of Irish Aid, of Ireland's, effectively, of Ireland's development policy. Um, and, and it's interesting because why did Ireland establish Irish Aid? Because we joined what was the European Economic Community, now the European Union. It was one of the requisites of being a member that uh, you establish a development programme. And I often think that we in Ireland, in our development trajectory, have benefited hugely from being a member of the European Union, from pooling sovereignty, and from developing those trading and investment relationships that brought Ireland in a very small number, few decades from being essentially a developing country to one of the more prosperous developed countries in the world. So I think we have a particular role to play uh, in, in, in helping bridge gaps that may uh, develop from time to time or may exist between the developed and the developing world. And the world, the work of UNCTAD, it really chimes very well with Ireland's commitment to supporting inclusive and sustainable economic growth. We know that developing countries need ongoing support to build trade infrastructure, develop policies and simplify the process of trading across borders. And we know the complexity, uh, complexities of the relationship between trade and development. We know it particularly because of our own experience. Um, and we welcome the strong commitments conveyed by UNCTAD in relation to climate and biodiversity crises. I say this having just returned myself from COP at the weekend. Global trade is both part of the problem and part of the solution. And we really look forward to hearing from uh, Rebecca on, on this. Ireland um, works with UNCTAD and has supported in particular its port management program since 2007. <clears throat> which actually brings benefits, is an all-Ireland program of helping uh, developed countries, ports, train um, train their people. And, it, you know, it brings together ports in Ireland and has helped us in Ireland uh, develop um, as well as working with developing countries as well. We also are a supporter of UNCTAD's Debt Management and Financial Analysis System Programme, which is one of the leading providers of technical cooperation and advisory services in the area of debt management, an area of debt on which I know Rebecca will speak today. So just to, uh, to conclude, it is, it is unfortunately the case that we live in a world of overlapping crises, political, security, economic, development, humanitarian, and all in the overall existent framework of the existential threat of, um, of climate change. So UNCTAD, which has been for years a really strong actor in terms of thinking and reporting on development, 
I think has an increasingly important role uh, to play. It may have been in recent years that the European Union and more developed countries have not played the same role with UNCTAD that they might have, but I think uh, the importance of UNCTAD is becoming really clear in this in this era of multiple crises. And non, non, and perhaps that became incredibly clear when the UN Secretary General asked Rebecca Greenspan and UNCTAD to play take a leading role on the Black Sea grain uh, uh, deal uh, in the in the in the in the conflict with Ukraine. A, a very important role uh, for UNCTAD there. So I would just say that at this time when trust and confidence is needed more than ever between the so-called developed and the so-called uh, developing world, uh, I would say that the role of UNCTAD cannot be uh, overemphasized. There is a really important role for UNCTAD to play. I think as Secretary General, Rebecca Greenspan has already been working really hard to build trust and confidence in the work of the organization and I really look forward to hearing from her now on the role that UNCTAD can play globally in this difficult time and how Ireland can work more effectively with you and with UNCTAD. You're very, very welcome, Rebecca, and we really look forward to hearing from you. And I'll hand back to David now. Um, she'll speak to us for about 20 to 25 minutes, um, and then we will go over to... Uh, Q and A. Um, um, people can join the discussion using the Q and A function uh, on Zoom. Please feel free to send in your questions at any point that they occur to you, or your comments and observations, and we will come to them when the Secretary General has finished her presentation. A reminder that both today's presentation and the Q and A are on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion on. Uh, X or formerly Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Uh, we're also live streaming this morning's discussion, so a very warm welcome to all of you joining us by YouTube. Rebecca Greenspan uh, was appointed Secretary General of UNCTAD in 2021. Uh, she is a very distinguished economist from her uh, native country, Costa Rica, and also a political leader, having served as Vice President uh, from 1994 to 98. She's the first woman and indeed the first Central American to hold the post of Secretary General of UNCTAD. Uh, she's a former uh, Under Secretary General um, uh, at the UNDP, and uh, she also holds a number of key posts. Uh, Michael touched on one a moment ago relating to the, the Black Sea um, deal, and she's also a member of the G20 High Level Independent Panel on Financing. Global Commons for Pandemic Preparedness and Response. With that, Rebecca, once again, you're, you're warmly welcome, and I'd now like to invite you to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you to the friends of IIEA and to the Irish Aid. Thank you also, Michael, for your extremely good in introduction and for the generosity of you, you both. Uh, and well, Thank you, everybody that is listening and with us during this uh, during this time. Let me. Uh, the title of of my talk today was about what I called polyglobalization, <laughs> uh, debt, trade, and geopolitics. But I want to say before starting that I really want this to be a conversation, not not. Uh, a one-way communication. <laughs> so I will try to be, uh, you know, short relatively, and uh, I will expect to address a lot of the things also that Michael put on the table in the questions and in the interaction with the public, if that is okay. Thank so uh, we, 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 we are no doubt in a uh, new era of globalization, yes? And there are objective reasons for this, there are subjective reasons for this, and there are a lot of names that have been given already <laughs> to this new period. Uh, you know, let me, let me go through several of the names that this period, period has been given go through the reasons for that, because that gives us a very smooth entrance to the topic. And then I will 
try to explain why I call it polyglobalization. Yes. Mm. So Danny Roderick, for example, from Harvard University, is calling this era the era of productivism. Yes, in reference mm. to the return of industrial policy in the global economy and especially in the West. Uh, Arvind Subramanian and Martin Kessler from the Peterson Institute of Economics that they just uh, released a very good uh, paper last month are calling this new era deglobalization in goods and globalization in services. <laughs> And the, in, in each of these, I will refer to them, there is part of the phenomena that we are, you know, a, a seeing. The Economist magazine is calling this new era, the era of homeland economics, in reference to the growth of protectionism and the inward turn in trade. And the WTO and, and many others have called this new era, the era of re globalization, yes, in reference to the need to return to trade as an engine for growth and development. <laughs> so I think of all these terms, I like important aspects of this new era. It is true, for example, that as the Peterson Institute says, there are part of trade that are deglobalizing. As the paper well documents, from 1992 to 2008, global exports grew at close to 10% a year in nominal terms, while GDP grew at around 6% per year. And here was one of the elements, the important elements of what was called hyper-globalization. Yes, this period of hyper-globalization where trade was growing much faster than GDP. And in a way, it was the engine of growth during all uh, that period. But since the global financial crisis, trade has grown at a much slower rate than GDP growth. This year, for example, Antat is estimating that a, a global GDP will grow at a rate of 3% and trade will grow only 1%, to, to put the example of today. But since the global financial crisis, we have seen that slowing down of trade in the general economy. I would say that the period of a, of the COVID-19 and the pandemic and the rebound after the pandemic is, a, is, is just a period that doesn't show the trend. So the trend we have seen, the structural trend has been more, you know, of a slowing down. So uh, there are nuances in this deglobalization, quote unquote, trade, uh, because you know, trade has not declined. <laughs> what has declined or slowed down is the rate of growth, yes? Trade is still growing, but it is growing slow, slower, as I said before, than GDP. And that is what the data says, yes? Importantly is that it's true that there is this dematerialization of trade. Goods are growing much slower than services. In fact, digital services have been growing very well during the last period. So that's why in the Peterson uh, document, they talk also about this dematerialization of goods, you know, and, you know, the, the services part of this, of this equation. That said, finance, which is integral to trade and development, has indeed deglobalized, without question, since the global financial crisis. Foreign direct investment never recovered after the global financial crisis. And foreign direct investment towards the global south uh, has really, uh, you know, slow, slowed down. So, in a way, the picture here is mixed, you know, and whatever this picture says, globalization 
might might be a more apt term than deglobalization. <laughs> yes, uh, but this finance part. Uh, let me just emphasize here because, in a way, if we think aloud, what are two fundamental elements for the grow, for the possibility to grow of the global south is trade and investment. Yes, and both has not recovered since the global financial crisis. Uh, let me give you a, a one one indicator that I remember. You know, uh, Africa receives only 2% of the investments that go towards renewable energy. Only 2% of total direct investment going to renewable energy. That is one of the things that have been growing in terms of investment as, uh, in the West and in the North. Yes. So the Global South is not receiving in the investment that they need in foreign direct investment and trade is slowing down. So the two pillars of the possibility of the developing world to catch up are very weak right now. And so in global growth, in average, you know, have been slowing down too, because it's not only that trade is growing less than GDP, is that GDP is really growing very slowly. Yes, there is also a growth element in the global economy. When it comes to Roderick, the return of industrial policy is indeed a fact. You know, I still remember when I was in government, when I was in the Minister of Finance in the 80s, or when I was Vice President in the 90s, you know, we were really fighting with all the IFIS and the international community because we wanted to have a development strategy and a sectorial strategy. And they said the best industrial strategy is the one that doesn't exist. That was the motto of those years. Yes, and now industrial, industrial policy is back. Uh, it is back with a vengeance, as I said, <laughs> in a way. Um, uh, and uh, most, but most of this new industrial policy is focused on renewable energies and critical minerals. And, you know, you have here the US has the Inflation Reduction Act, the EU has the Next Generation Funds. Uh, Saudi Arabia has the Vision 2030. Japan, China, Korea are redoubling their investments. Africa is hoping that the African continental free trade area will add value to their critical minerals. And, and South America is also thinking about doing the same that Indonesia did with the nickel to do the same with the lithium. Yes? So there are all these things going on. The problem is that all of this is being done under the gray zone of a WTO without an appellate body. Yes? So this means that there is a lot of ambiguity in the system. And importantly, this is happening in a context where the fiscal space of most developing countries is not only zero, in some of them negative. <laughs> Yes, because of the debt. So what Michael was saying about the cascading crisis, you know, we have, we have climate change, we had the pandemic, we have the war in Ukraine, and now the war in Gaza. Yeah. So all this cascading crisis it, the, it have left the developing countries bare bone, it, with the exception of the emerging economy. So if you look at the global panorama, you know, it's true that there, there, there is a divergent path between the North and the South, but within the North, we see the US doing very well and Europe basically entering, entering maybe in recession. <laughs> and in the South, you see the emerging economies doing well, but the rest of the developing countries doing very badly. So you have divergence in the two blocks, but you have divergence within the blocks also. 
but the truth is that the the developing countries don't have the with the exception of uh, some of the emerging they don't have the fiscal space to do an industrial policy based on subsidies uh, and debt has uh, even uh, uh, made this problem even worse uh, the number i i won't enter into the whole discussion of debt but the number that we are giving is that right now there are 3.3 billion people that live in countries that spend more in servicing the debt than on health or education. So almost half the planet live in countries that are spending more in servicing the debt than in health and education. So how, how are we going to get to the sustainable development goals? with that, you know, and why is it that we are not calling this a debt crisis is because the markets are not suffering. Most of the countries that are entering into a debt problem with the exception of Argentina, that is a case in itself and has been <laughs> through history, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but why the markets are not suffering is because the countries that are in debt trouble are medium and, and small countries. The emerging markets have been protected. They have different arrangements. Yes, they have swaps or a contingency financial uh, uh, um, uh, flows that they can uh, 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 tackle from. But the other countries don't have it. And so, as I say, as I say, markets are not suffering but people are, yes? And 3.3 .3 billion people is not a marginal number. Now, returning to the, to the many names, uh, we have the economist that, as I said, was emphasizing the issue of protectionism. And it is true that there is a lot that uh, of what is going on uh, in the context of geopolitics that is also a, a lot of protectionism uh, uh, rising again. Uh, a lot referring to semiconductors and, and also an interesting uh, uh, part of this protectionism has focused on, on renewables. Yes. Uh, it is well known that the Inflation Reduction Act caused tensions with Europe because of the local, local um, content restrictions in the, in the IRA. Yes. Electric cars, wind turbines, and solar panels, especially those coming from China because of geopolitical uh, tensions, are also under targeted sanctions. As the Economist reports, and I quote, America has in effect locked out Chinese solar manufacturers with hefty anti-dumping duties. As a result, solar modules are more than twice as expensive in the country, in the US, as elsewhere. Europe is sending mixed signals. Yes, the EU has dropped earlier anti-dumping duties on Chinese panels, but on November it passed the Net Zero Industry Act, which will introduce minimum domestic content levels for public renewable energy contracts. So this is the panorama. And lastly, we have the WTO and the question of re-globalization. Re what this emphasizes is the fact that under the previous era of globalization, rising trade went hand in hand with higher growth in accelerating development prospects. During the previous era of globalization, we met the Millennium Development Goals for poverty alleviation five years ahead of schedule. Let's remember that because we all forgot already, yes, about the uh, Millennium Development Goals. Today, we are in the midpoint of the 2030 agenda and only 15%, only 15% of all sustainable development goals are on track to be achieved in 2030, only 15%. Well, 
and this is a very big problem. SDGs, as I say always, are too big to fail. They are more than a set of targets. They are our last common agenda in a world that is more polarized than ever, in a world in desperate need of solidarity and multilateralism. So uh, we, we, we need to take this seriously. We know that millions of people are suffering out there. We must have the wisdom to take this as a warning because we are seeing the world today as it will look like in 2030 if the SDG fails. <laughs> so if we want a better world, yes, and not the cascading crisis world that we are seeing today, we will need to recover the dynamism and uh, for the sustainable development agenda. Well, so let me uh, uh, go then now of why I call this new era polyglobalization. In my view, the issue is that all the other terms that I have highlighted that have a, an important element to reflect on are too Western focus. If you look at globalization from the South, there is not a globalization to speak of. Those who were involved in the last two G20 presidencies, for example, in Indonesia and that, and in India can see very clearly the growing role of the emerging economies and their views and desires for globalization. These countries want more, not less globalization. These countries want, you know, a, a better, a different kind of globalization, one that is more adapted to the realities of 2023 and not of the realities of 1945. This has implications for the whole system, for trade, yes, but also for finance and development finance, for currencies, for peace and security, and for multilateralism itself. These are two features that stand out here. One is regionali re regionalization, and that's why we are calling this polyglobalization, because we see a drive towards a regional regionalization. And let me give you an example of what we have seen in regional trade agreements uh, after the 2018-2019 uh, financial crisis. And so we have seen in the last two decades, regional trade agreements growth in a parabolic way from around 75 regional trade agreements in the year 2000 to now 325. Most of this growth has taken place in the last five years. So there is something here happening that some have talked about nearshoring and reshoring, but this is more than only nearshoring or reshoring. This is also more regionalization. And it's a regionalization not to stop participating in global trade, but to participate better in global trade. You see, it's not a regionalization to get away from global trade and from the global economy. It's a regionalization to try to insert ourselves in the global economy in a better, in a better way. And apart from regionalization, the other feature that I see is a, a, the the a, a, what what can be called competitive multilateralism? Yes, that is that there is decentralized multilateralism happening. You have the G seven, the G twenty, the BRICS, just to mention some, and so. It seems that what we have is a multilateralism with competing poles in development finance through regional development banks, 
big overseas cooperation initiatives. We have the Europe's Global Gateway, America's Build Back Better, China's Belt and Road Initiative. Yes. Now, this is still not a fragmented, a fragmented system, but it's a competing system. And I think that this is the other characteristic of this polyglobalization that we are seeing. But as I said, so is we have this regionalism for on the one hand and this competitive multilateralism on, on the other. One, one data, one, one indicator that I didn't uh, give you before about South-South trade, because I said there is no deglobalization in the South-South trade. South-South trade has been growing at a 9.3% on average for the last 20 years, at a 9.3% per average in the last 20, 20 years. So let me uh, uh, fi finish, you know, start finishing with this idea. There is a reconfiguration of the era of hyper-globalization. And there is a reconfiguration of the global value chains. There, there, there is regionalization, there is industrial policy, there is the drive for sustainability in trade. And all of this is shaping this new era where geopolitics is and, and digitalization are a, also very important in, in strong forces in that reconfiguration. So to, to finalize, I want to take one of the points that Michael referred to, that is the trust deficit between the global North and the global South, and how that unfolds in this era of polyglobalization will in many ways set the trend for the decades to come. Polyglobalization doesn't have to be bad. Could, you know, polyglobalization could call for reimagining globalization. Um, one that transcends traditional West and North centric models and incorporates this diversification that we are seeing in the global economy and the different perspectives and needs, particularly coming from the developing world. A polyglobalization could be not a concept, but it could be a, an action for a more cooperative, more inclusive and more sustainable global future. A, we, are, we always a, a, say this, you know, healthy competition and deepen Deepen, uh, deeper cooperation. <laughs> Competition doesn't not necessarily have to be seen as a problem for the system. Yes, it could help the global economy if we at the same time can deepen our uh, cooperation and coordination. So we, can, we could go beyond conventional paradigms and work more collaboratively collaboratively towards a global economy that could benefit all. Now, the jury is out there. <laughs> you know, the world can go instead, instead of healthy competition and deeper cooperation, it can go for fragmentation. I really believe that decision has not been taken by the big powers yet. But if we don't, you know, a, a adjourn our institutions to the new realities, at the end, that will end happening. So thank you. I don't hear you. Sorry. Uh, thank uh, you very much, um, Becca. Those were extremely interesting and and. Uh, uh, and thought-provoking um, insights. I mean, uh, there's a lot that we will relate to there. Um, I think that the emphasis you put on the kind of a new version of, a new understanding of globalization and the 
the idea of healthy competition between regions, between different players, um, that makes, uh, you know, it is, it's a very positive uh, perspective and um, I think it's very timely. Uh, it reminded me a lot of how in the wider implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, there's actually a greater emphasis now on regional energies, regional uh, activity. It's not purely a global agenda. It's one where, in many ways, the momentum has to come from in individual countries, but also individual regions. And what you, the vision you set out there for globalization, in many ways, parallels that. A number of questions have have, have come in, Rebecca. So let me begin with the issue of debt relief. I mean, when, when I was, I think you, you were at the SDGs summit in September uh, and uh, high level week. And as you indicated, there was a big uh, theme there about the need to make it easier for LDCs to, to get uh, fair allocations from the international financial institutions and for, in particular, their debt burden to be eased. One question here uh, asks really what, what UNCTAD can do to promote uh, fairer treatment of LDCs by the, the IFIs, by the international financial uh, institutions, particularly um, given that there has been heavy emphasis up to now on middle-income countries. So what, what new direction can be taken by the World Bank, IMF and so on in order to um, address the huge, huge burden um, that developing countries have in terms of debt servicing? And your particular um, statistic is, is very, very uh, striking there, the one about the 3.3 billion people. I mean, that, that says it all, and it, it, it's quite a, a memorable figure. Anyway, over to you with this question about uh, debt relief and the role of IFIs in lowering it. Yeah, first of all, let's let's put the objective of what has to happen in these countries. Let's remember that the number of countries that are commodity dependent has gone up, not down. <laughs> so there you have already a problem. Yes, if these countries don't diversify their productive structure, they will continue to be LDCs. Mm. They cannot add value, they will have this volatility in their economy. They are price takers, yes. Uh, they won't have enough jobs for the new, uh, for the youth and for the new generations. They cannot make the transition to a sustainable future. And now they have an opportunity because most of the critical minerals that we need for the energy mm -hmm. transition are in the LDC countries. And the numbers are striking. They have, uh, Africa has 80% of the reserves of manganese or, or half of the reserves of lithium or, you know, 60% of the reserve of uh, platinum minerals or etc. So what we are saying, this is the moment in which they have to add value to the extractive. And that means supporting them in the negotiations, looking at many of the investment agreements that they have signed in the past that doesn't allow them to do this. And we have to look back to the trades, to the uh, trade rules that doesn't allow these countries, you know, to add value as part of the policy instruments. For example, Indonesia. Indonesia just decided to forbid the exports of nickel in as, as raw material. They were taken to WTO. And in the first instance of WTO, they lost because TRIMS, the treaty, doesn't allow to do that. You see my point with not with the with the rules. And okay, they lost, but they appealed. And because there is no appellate body, <laughs> so <laughs> nothing can happen. <laughs> but you know, that that is the only way in which Indonesia can do some industrial policy, let's put it that way, or diversification policy to add value. What the West countries do, they give subsidies, but Indonesia cannot go that way. And they give subsidies to supposedly green goods. So they say, 
we should be able to do this because this will help the green transition. And so that will create another asymmetry with, <laughs> with the developing countries. But we can help these countries diversify. We can help them in the negotiations, you know, in terms of their critical minerals. We can push for more transparency for because of the illicit financial flows that always are related to this. And the African free trade area can have a very a good impact on the possibility of the global value chains within the continent. And so we are helping also African continent to, you know, to support, we are supporting the free trade area in Africa too. The rules of origin are very important to add value and to, you know, these are very concrete things that we can do in practice, yes? The other thing is that we need to help these countries with the digitalization agenda, yes? The digitalization agenda is the new uh, name of the game and they will have to really leapfrog, you know, uh, in the digital agenda. So we help them and support them in the digitalization. And uh, there are very concrete uh, programs that we have with many of these countries that have been very good. Let me give you an example with Angola, that is an LDC. Um, we made a program that was a very comprehensive program. We were in Angola for four years and there was somebody from ANCAT in Angola every week for four years, you know, doing sectoral programming, doing digitalization, doing uh, norms and competition laws, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, it has been a very well evaluated program. One of the things we did is digitalization of customs. You know how much their income in customs went up? 44%. Give me a policy that you can you know, for 44% of resource, you know, of internal resource mobilization in a country. So we can do that in the, at the national level. Now, at the international level, that was part of the question, yes? We are pushing the multilateral development banks because they can scale up their loans. They have become too small for the challenge. Too small for the challenge. The World Bank is today one fifth of what they were with respect to the global economy in 1960. One fifth. So the G20 had this commission that made a series of recommendations for the multilateral development banks to improve their balance sheets. They can do much more with what they have and they need a new capitalization. They need more capital. And we are you know, trying to push for an agenda that will allow the, 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 the development banks, the network of development banks, to scale up to 500 billion per year in terms of loans for the developing world. If they do that, they will have also, they will have to change their models to, to, to be able to crowd in private capital. We know that they, they <laughs> what they do can be much more, but it's not enough. <laughs> yes, mm. we need to bring private investment. But private investment won't come and you know easily unless they have the risking factors, and the risking factors can come from the multilateral development banks. That combination can be very important. And the last point I will make is a debt restructuring for these countries. And uh, the system that we have now is ineffective and very slow. We have done three restructurings in three years. And we have 52 countries in that position. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just <laughs> let's do the arithmetics, yes? If you, you know, there are countries that have been three years negotiating, three years negotiating, and they still have not received one additional dollar <coughs> in their economies. 
and I will make a, a political point here. I, 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 I was in Costa Rica when we were negotiating. <clears throat> started at the, in the 80s. We finalized at the end of the 80s. That was the last decade of Latin America. Mm. Yes, because that's what it took until we recover and stabilize the flows. You know, if that will happen again, it's a disaster. It's a disaster. And you know what? Most of the countries that made all the adjustments to be able to pay the debt, those political parties lost the election. <laughs> mm. you know? So you are, you have these people that, you know, in, in Africa, you know, that I, I have seen doing the right thing, taking the right policies, trying to be a, a good citizen in the world, but they just receive punishment, you know, because it takes so long that when elections come, the population <laughs> really, you know, don't support them because all they saw is the stick and they never see the carrot. And I think that we have to, to have a more sensible system to do yeah. Thanks, Rebecca. A couple of other questions here. Uh, one relates to um, uh, your view of what kind of reforms are needed in the uh, international financial institutions to give the Global South greater representation uh, than it has at the moment. So this is a, a structural question. And a, a second question relates to the SDGs stimulus uh, initiative taken by the Secretary General. You would have been involved closely with him and, and, and with, 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 with that effort. How do you assess the success of that a couple of months after the, the SDG summit? Very, very good. Well, uh, first on governance, uh, obviously, you know, one of the problems that we have had in raising the quotas of the IMF that is finally, I, I, I understand it will happen. Yes and uh, in the capitalization of the banks is because that will be done, you will have to make a realignment with the new realities and it will give China a much greater role in the IMF and the World Bank. Still the West will maintain, you know, a most, a, the, 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 the lead in the voting, in the voting but uh, China will raise a lot because China, you know, the, the participation the quota of China is uh, uh, really very small with respect to the participation of China in the global economy. So that that has been a geopolitical point that has, you know, it has been a, a challenge, an obstacle to do the <laughs> the real realignment and the capitalization of the World Bank and and the IMF. Uh, the IMF has postponed the discussion on on, on realignment to 2025. Uh, and here between us is probably because it will be after the elections in the US. Yes, <laughs> nothing will happen mm -hmm. before that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in the World Bank, they are going through some models for um, of guarantees for the private sector uh, to not have to go to capitalization, but to give more capacity uh, to the World Bank to really bring in a uh, private investment. Uh, those are second best, yes, but at least there are steps in the right direction. Um, so in that sense, I think that we have been able to push the agenda, yes. The, the, the G20 has been also an, an important fora for that, and mm -hmm. we have been, I think, an important voice. Some of that uh, now, also in terms of governance is not only China. Many of the countries that became, that are today in the world were not independent when we, we, when we structured the system, yes? So the representation is very small in the Bretton Woods institutions. And, and in the Security Council, they are obviously not, not represented, yes? So, uh, th there has to be a more inclusive governance structure that has to be discussed for the future, for these countries to be better represented. Anyway, they are, uh, for example, AIDA has a different configuration, even within the World Bank. And 
So that is welcome. So some of that can be a bridging, you know, in some of the funds, a bridging way for a full governance restructuring. Now, this is a very important element of the summit of the future that the Secretary General is putting forward and the international financial architecture reform that will be discussed in next year in, in July. Yes, so we are preparing for that discussion and governance will be an important element of this. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to the SDG stimulus, the important thing that happened in September uh, with the SDG summit is that the SDG stimulus is in the declaration. And that is a recognition that the UN has a role to play. And I think that that was the most important thing. Uh, one of the most important things that happened in the, in the SDG summit, the acknowledgement that this is not a, a, an external issue to the UN, that the voice of the UN and more diversity of voices should be listened to when it comes to financial, the financial aspects of the SDGs. And uh, I think that the SDG stimulus is very concrete. It has very concrete measures and we will continue to push for it. The um, increasing the quota, uh, the quotas of the IMF, I think that is part of it. You know, it was one of the things that we said from, from the beginning, we're still fighting to take away the surcharges in interest rates for the for the countries that are over quota um, and for uh, a more more space for liquidity support to the country so liquidity problems don't become debt problems yes uh, the the difficult part is still the debt restructuring you know, the agreement to go towards a more effective and stable system is not there. And probably that will be a big part of the discussion going forward. Thank you very much for that, Rebecca. Um, a question here about um, the, the COP28 summit. Um, uh, how do you react to the progress made so far, but are you expecting a breakthrough uh, uh, over the next couple of days on the issue of fossil fuels? <laughs> That's a very difficult one. Yeah. I, I made, a, a, you know, I, I gave an interview in, in C C CNN Arabia and uh, I was asked this question <clears throat> that why are fossil fuels and I said, you know, you have to face out, you know, the new investments and the... the the financing of new investments in, in fossil fuels, because if not, um, it won't happen, you know? And um, it, that was a discussion with somebody that was in the mm -hmm. panel precisely <laughs> about that. It continues to be a very contentious uh, mm -hmm. element, yes? Um, but let me say, I think that the loss and damage agreement yeah. gave hope to the COP, to the COP, and the, the, even if it's not all what is needed, but it was an important pledge, you know, towards loss and damage. And the, the, agree, the interim agreement that it will be hosted in the World Bank is, oh, uh, I think, that a good decision. Uh, maybe the, one, the decision that is still pending is the governance, yes? Mm -hmm how the governance of the fund will be carried out. Hello? Yes, yeah. Uh, yes, oh, yeah, I, my, my, my screen went. Okay, okay sorry. Uh, so uh, that, that, uh, um, that needs still, there are elements that still need to be, uh, to be worked out, but it was a good, a good thing. Uh, I, I, haven't followed in the last three days the negotiations. So, but the, the Secretary General is already there. He was very strong on the fossil fuel issue. I don't think that um, it will go into the declaration. It didn't seem so some, some days ago. 
uh, with the strength that uh, was uh, wanted, but there will be a white coalition, I think, mm -hmm. what now is being called plurinational, yes? That I think that will go ahead with that. Uh, from the numbers I have, David, maybe it's important to say this. Uh, part of the problem is that the financing is coming from the North still. The financing for the new fossil fuel investments. Mm -hmm. So even if it doesn't go into the COP28 declaration, the thing is how to stop the flow of financing resources for the new investments in fossil fuels. And maybe that is a conversation that we need to have. Indeed, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Rebecca, and, and I think we have time for two more questions, though. In fact, there are plenty more one, one could ask. Uh, one, one relates to um, uh, how you see the Black Sea deal on grain exports. Uh, what are the chances of getting back to getting that restored in the way it should be happening? Uh, I know that you've, you've played a, a, a key role there. Um, and then a, a final question, if, you, if we have time, would be simply to look at the multiplicity of conflicts that we have at present. I mean, clearly Gaza, most of all, yeah, but Ukraine, uh, Ethiopia, Indonesia. The question asked is, um, what kind of impact will this sort of global instability have on trade flows, on the kind of, uh, you know, the trade and development nexus that you're trying to promote in UNCTAD? I mean, how worried do we need to be about the the, the 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 rising number of conflicts, which inevitably undermine co the cooperation you need for trade? With respect to BSGI, to to the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, well, I it's important to to maybe uh, repeat what happened during the year that it was on. First of all, it was a miracle that we we could make this deal in the middle of the war. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. and, and really the initiative of the Secretary General, you know, and, and the idea of these two agreements, you know, the memorandum of understanding between Russia and the UN uh, to facilitate exports of food and fertilizer from the Russian Federation and the corridor in the Black Sea for Ukraine to be able to export. And it really stabilized markets. You know, prices went down 23% during that period, 23%. And uh, if, if uh, the World Bank is right, for every 1% in the global food index of FAO, and each 1% increase means 10 million people going in below the poverty line. Mm. Okay, so 23% of decrease in prices is a big thing for 200 million people in the world. Yes, that so, so and also the volatility of markets, you know, stopped and uh, my, you know, countries and markets had the possibility to adapt to the new situation. So when Russia withdrew in July, uh, prices didn't spike. Again, mm -hmm. there were fluctuations, but the trend of prices was going down because uh, on the one hand, Russia has a very good harvest and they are 20% of the market of wheat. Yes, yeah, so yeah. They, they are very important um, and they have a wonderful harvest. So the markets have factored that in. Uh, secondly, Ukraine is exporting through the corridor via Bulgaria and Romanian uh, international waters, yes. Uh, and so Ukraine has been able to restart uh, uh, exports and stabilize a little bit that corridor uh, also. Uh, and uh, there have been very good harvest in Europe. So markets are in the aggregate, okay. We are still worried about distributional effects because the uh, transaction costs continue to be very high for some 
small and medium-sized countries. Insurance, shipping, distances have also got longer despite all this, yes? And so, uh, as I say again, as I said in the debt issue, you know, the aggregate markets are okay, you know, but the clients are not the same. <laughs> Mm. And so big countries are taking a huge advantage of this situation, but the small and medium-sized countries have more difficulty and difficulty in food and difficulty in fertilizers. So part of, in, in some parts, we are already seeing the consequences of uh, the lack of access to fertilizers at the beginning of, of last year, especially in West Africa. And also... The other thing that happened is that even if international prices went down, eh, domestic prices went up because of devaluation of currencies. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of devaluation of currencies because of the hike in, in, in interest rates of the central banks in the US and in Europe and, and UK. So the devaluation of currencies made internal prices you know, go up. And that has caused huge problems in many countries, including some of the ones that have been mentioned. Ethiopia, for example, Egypt, you know, in Ethiopia prices went, at one point prices of food went up 180%. Mm. So this is a destabilizing factor that we still have to put attention to. Now, where are we? <laughs> Where are we in the negotiations? <laughs> That's a difficult question to ask, to, to, to answer, but I will say what I can say. <laughs> mm. Okay. Uh, first of all, we continue in contact and in consultations with the, with the Russian Federation and with Ukraine. Mm. But it's, it is clear that we are not going back to the former deal. Oh. But... Mm because that is already uh, have, has been overcome in terms of the functionality that it had. Uh, what we are trying is to secure trade in the Black Sea, because what we don't want is the disruption of trade in the Black Sea, because that will, again, if the aggression in the Black Sea uh, will, will escalate. Mm -hmm. An escalation in the Black Sea is very dangerous. It's a huge risk. And so what we are trying is to get a formula that will guarantee safe trade in the Black Sea. And if we can do that, that will be a huge contribution for stability in the future. It will. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, the, the, the Russian Federation is coming for consultations now in the 14th of this week. Yeah. Um, with respect to um, uh, what we can do in the multiplicity of, uh, what was the yeah. last question? It was, I mean, we're perhaps a little bit over time now, Rebecca, but that was, it was really a question just given all the global instability because of the various conflicts, what sort of impact will that have on trade levels, trade mm -hmm. stability? Yeah, uh, well, you know that today there is a, 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 a news from Bloomberg that mm -hmm. says, and I read, global trade to drop 5% oh. this year amid geopol geopolitical headwinds. Uh, so obviously also the, the, the war in Gaza is, yeah. uh, is not helping, as I, I said before, in uh, Ukraine, Russia, continues, uh, the, there, is, there are geopolitical tensions in other parts, as you said. What we are trying to do, and maybe let me answer uh, in this sense, um, you know, we put together for the Ukrainian-Russia negotiations and, 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 and especially the impact, we put together the Global Crisis Response Group. Mm -hmm. And we conform in ANCTAD a group to look beyond the very immediate impact in the countries of crisis or of conflict to look at the global economy. 
and more on the socioeconomic impact. That's what we did very effectively, you know, in the Global Crisis Response Group. And we changed the narrative. We said, look, you are not looking at what is happening in the rest of the world that is also suffering because of the war. Not only the surroundings, yes, but there was a global economy that was suffering. And uh, I think that we did that very effectively. And we are planning to continue supporting, you know, the, uh, the, secret the secretariat and the secretary general in trying to, you know, be above, you know, ahead the curve yeah. in yeah. terms of very immediately try to see where the hot spots, the problems from the different crises are coming in, uh, in a crisis mode, not in a only a, 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 a research mode. Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> and I, I hope that we can continue providing that to the world and to the UN. I think that it was very important you know, we, did, uh, we have proven the concept and now we need to work on it to Indeed. make it, you know, yeah. broader than only the Ukraine. Uh, the exactly, Ukraine. exactly. Rebecca, thank you very, very much for giving so generously of your time and giving us your uh, analysis and uh, some, some really uh, challenging thoughts, especially around what globalization should, should mean. It was really fantastic having you with us uh, I, I know I speak on behalf of the Institute and also the, the, the whole audience uh, in thanking you warmly for making this time available. I, I'm, I'm sure I speak on Michael's behalf as well. It was great, great to see you. We look forward to seeing you at some point in Ireland. Uh, we will follow up on that. In the meantime, best of luck with everything you're doing in all those, in all those areas. And thank you once again for, for being with us now. Thank you very okay. much. A pleasure.